Chapter fifty one of David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ty Kynes. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter fifty one. The beginning of a longer journey. It was yet early in the morning of the following day when, as I was walking in my garden with my aunt, who took little other exercise now being so much in attendance on my dear Dora, I was told that Mr. Peggotty desired to speak with me. He came into the garden to meet me half way on my going towards the gate, and bared his head as it was always his custom to do when he saw my aunt, for whom he had a high respect. I had been telling her all that had happened overnight. Without saying a word, she walked up with a cordial face, shook hands with him, and patted him on the arm. It was so expressively done that she had no need to say a word. Mr. Peggotty understood her quite as well as if she had said a thousand. "'I'll go in now, Trot,' said my aunt, "'and look after little Blossom, who will be getting up presently.' "'Not along of my being here, ma'am, I hope,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'unless my wits has gone a bad's neesin', by which Mr. Peggotty meant to say birds nesting, this morning, tis along of me as you're a-goin' to quit us.' "'You have something to say, my good friend,' returned my aunt, "'and will do better without me.' "'By your leave, ma'am,' returned Mr. Peggotty, "'I would take a kind, pervisin' you doin't my my clickin', if you'd bide here.' "'Would you?' said my aunt, with short good nature. "'Then I am sure I will.' So she drew her arm through Mr. Peggotty's and walked with him to a leafy little summer-house there was at the bottom of the garden, where she sat down on a bench and I beside her. There was a seat for Mr. Peggotty too, but he preferred to stand, leaning his hand on the small rustic table. As he stood looking at his cap for a little while before beginning to speak, I could not help observing what power and force of character his sinewy hand expressed, and what a good and trusty companion it was to his honour right, and when she did, she kneeled down on my feet, and kinder said to me, as if it was her prayers, how it all came to be. You may believe me, when I heard her voice, as I had heard her home so playful, and seed her humble, as it might be in the dust our Saviour wrote in with his blessed hand, I felt a wound go to my heart in the midst of all its thankfulness. He drew his sleeve across his face without any pretence of concealing why, and then cleared his voice. It weren't for long as I felt that, for she was found. I had only to think as she was found, and it was gone. I don't know why I do so much as mention of it now, I'm sure. I didn't have it in my mind a minute ago to say a word about myself, but it come up so natural that I yielded to it afore I was aware. You're a self-denying soul, said my aunt, and will have your reward. Mr. Peggotty, with the shadows of the leaves playing athwart his face, made a surprised inclination of the head towards my aunt, as an acknowledgment of her good opinion, then took up the thread he had relinquished. "'When my Emily took flight,' he said, in stern wrath for the moment, "'from the house where she was made a prisoner by that there spotted snake as Master Davy see, "'and his story's true, and may God confound him, she took flight in the night. "'It was a dark night with a many stars a-shining. "'She was wild. She ran along the sea-beach, believing the old boat was there, "'and calling out to us to turn away our faces, for she was a-coming by.' she heard herself a-crying out like as if it was another person and cut herself on them sharp pointed stones and rocks and felt it no more than if she had been rock herself ever so far she run and there was fire afore her eyes and roarings in her ears of a sudden or so she thought you understand the day broke wet and windy and she was lying below a heap of stone upon the shore and a woman was a-speaking to her saying in the language of that country what was it that had gone so much amiss he saw everything he related. It passed before him as he spoke so vividly that in the intensity of his earnestness he presented what he described to me with greater distinctness than I can express. I can hardly believe, writing now, long afterwards, but that I was actually present in these scenes. They were impressed upon me with such an astonishing air of fidelity. As Emily's eyes, which was heavy, see this woman bear, Mr. Peggotty went on, she knowed as she was one of them as had often talked to her on the beach, for, though she had drawn, as I have said, ever so far in the night, she had oftentimes wandered long ways, partly afoot, partly of boats and carriages, and knowed all that country long the coast miles and miles. She hadn't no children of her own, this woman, being a young wife, but she was a-looking to have one afore long, and may my prayers go up to heaven that twill be a happiness to her, and a comfort and a honour all her life. 
may it love her and be dutiful to her in her old age help of her at the last a angel to her here and hereafter amen said my aunt she had been somewhat timorous and down said mr peggotty and had sat at first a little way off at our spinning or such work as it was when emily talked to the children but emily had took notice of her and had gone and spoke to her and as the young woman was partial to the children herself they soon made friends sir mutcher that when emily went that way she always give emily flowers this was her as now asked her what it was that had gone so much amiss emily told her and she took her home she did indeed she took her home said mr peggotty covering his face he was more affected by this act of kindness than i had ever seen him affected by anything since the night she went away my aunt and i did not attempt to disturb him it was a little cottage you may suppose he said presently but she found space for emily in it her husband was away at sea and she kept it secret and prevailed upon such neighbours as she had there was not many near to keep it secret too Emily was took bad with fever, and what is very strange to me is, maybe tis not strange to scholars, the language of that country went out of her head, and she could only speak her own, that no one understood. She recollects, as if she had dreamt it, that she lay there always a talk in her own tongue, always believing as the old boat was round the next point in the bay, and begging and imploring of him to send there and tell how she was dying, to bring back a message of forgiveness, if it was only a word almost the whole time she thought now that him as i made mention on just now was lurking for her underneath the winder now that him as had brought her to this was in the room and cried to the young woman not to give her up and knowed at the same time that she couldn't understand and dreaded that she must be took away likewise the fire was afore her eyes and the roarings in her ears and there was no to-day nor yesterday nor yet to-morrow but everything in her life as ever had been or as ever could be and everything as never had been and as never could be was a crowding on her all at once and nothing was clear nor welcome and yet she sang and laughed about it how long this lasted i don't know but then there came a sleep and in that sleep from being a many times stronger than her own self she fell into the weakness of the littlest child here he stopped as if for relief from the terror of his own description after being silent for a few moments he pursued his story it was a pleasant afternoon when she awoke and so quiet that there wasn't a sound but the rippling of that blue sea without a tide upon the shore it was her belief at first that she was at home upon a sunday morning but the vine-leaves as she seed at the winder and the hills beyond weren't home and contradicted of her then in came her friend to watch alongside of her bed and then she knowed as the old boat weren't around the next point in the bay no more but was fur off and knowed where she was and why and broke out a-crying on that good woman's bosom where i hope her baby is a-lying now a-cheering of her with its pretty eyes he could not speak of this good friend of emily's without a flow of tears it was in vain to try he broke down again endeavouring to bless her that done my emily good he resumed after such emotion as i could not behold without sharing in and as to my aunt she wept with all her heart that done emily good and she begun to mend but the language of that country was quite gone from her and she was forced to make signs so she went on getting better from day to day slow but sure and trying to learn the names of common things names as she had seemed never to have heard in all her life till one evening came when she was a-sitting at her winder looking out at a little girl at play upon the beach and of a sudden this child held out her hand and said what would be in english fisherman's daughter here's a shell for you are to understand that they used at first to call her pretty lady as the general way in that country is and that she had taught him to call her fisherman's daughter instead the child says of a sudden fisherman's daughter here's a shell then emily understands her and she answers bursting out a crying and it all comes back when emily got strong again said mr peggotty after another short interval of silence she cast about to leave that young good creature and to get to her own country the husband was come home then and the two together put her aboard a small trader bound to leghorn and from that to france she had a little money but it was less than a little as they would take for all they had done i'm almost glad on it though they were so poor what they done is laid up where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Master Davy, it'll outlast all the treasures in the world.
Emily got to France and took service to wait on travelling ladies at an inn in the port. There there come one day that snake. Let him ever come nigh me. I do and know what hurt I might do him. So as she sees him without him seeing her, all her fears and wildest returned upon her, and she fled afore the very breath he drew, and come to England and was set ashore at Dover. I do it know, said Mr. Peggotty, for sure, when her art begun to fail her, but all the way to England she had thought to come to her dear home. Soon as she got to England she turned her face towards it, but fear of not being forgive, fear of being pointed at, fear of some of us being dead along of her, fear of many things, turned her from it, kinder by force, upon the road. Uncle, uncle, she says to me, the fear of not being worthy to do what my torn and bleeding breast so long to do, was the most frightening fear of all. I turned back when my heart was full of prayers that I might crawl up to the old doorstep in the night, kiss it, lay my wicked face upon it, and there be found dead in the morning. She comes, sir, said Mr. Peggotty, dropping his voice to an awe-stricken whisper, to London. She, as had never seen it in her life, alone without a penny, young, so pretty, came to London. Almost the moment she lighted here, all so desolate, she found, as she believed, a friend, a decent woman, as spoke to her about the needlework as she had been brought up to, about finding plenty of it for her, about a lodging for the night, and making secret inquiration concerning me and all at home to-morrow. "'When my child,' he said aloud, and with an energy of gratitude that shook him from head to foot, stood upon the brink of more than I can say or think on, Martha, true to her promise, saved her. I could not repress a cry of joy. "'Master Davy,' said he, gripping my hand and that strong hand of his, "'it was you as first made mention of her to me. I thank you, sir. She was earnest. She had known of her bitter knowledge where to watch and what to do. She had done it, and the Lord was above all. She come, white and hurried, upon Emily in her sleep. She says to her, "'Rise up from worse than death and come with me. Them belonging to the house might have stopped her, but they might as soon have stopped the sea.' "'Stand away from me,' she says. "'I am a ghost that calls her from beside her open grave.' She told Emily she had seen me, and knowed I loved her and forgive her. She wrapped her hasty in her clothes, and took her faint and trembling on her arm. She heeded no more what they said than if she had had no ears. She walked among them with my child, minding only her, and brought her safe out in the dead of night from that black pit of ruin. She attended on Emily, said Mr. Peggotty, who had released my hand, and put his own hand on his heaving chest. She attended to my Emily, lying wearied out and wandering betwixt twiles, till late next day. Then she went in search of me, then in search of you, Master Davy. She didn't tell Emily what she'd come out for, lest her heart should fail, and she should think of hiding herself. How the cruel lady knowed of her being there, I can't say. Whether him, as I have spoke so much of, chanced to see him going there, or whether, which is most likely to my thinking, he had heard it from the woman, I do not greatly ask myself. My niece is found. All night long, said Mr. Peggotty, we have been together, Emily and me. Tis little, considering the time, as she is said in words through them broken-hearted tears. Tis less as I have seen of her dear face as growed into a woman's at my heart. But all night long her arms has been about my neck, and her head has laid here, and we knows full well as we can put our trust in one another evermore. He ceased to speak, and his hand upon the table rested there in perfect repose, with a resolution in it that might have conquered lions. "'It was a gleam of light upon me, Trot,' said my aunt, drying her eyes, "'when I formed the resolution of being godmother to your sister Betsy Trotwood, who disappointed me. But next to that, hardly anything would have given me greater pleasure than to be godmother to that young creature's baby.' Mr. Peggotty nodded his understanding of my aunt's feelings, but could not trust himself with any verbal reference to the subject of her commendation. We all remained silent and occupied with our own reflections, my aunt drying her eyes and now sobbing convulsively, and now laughing and calling herself a fool, until I spoke. "'You have quite made up your mind,' said I to Mr. Peggotty. "'As to the future, good friend, I need scarcely ask you.' "'Quite, Master Davy.' he returned, and told Emily, "'There's mighty countries far from here. Our future life lays over the sea.' "'They will emigrate together, aunt,' said I. 
"'Yes,' said Mr. Peggotty, with a hopeful smile. "'No one can't reproach my darling in Australia. We will begin a new life over there.' I asked him if he yet proposed to himself any time for going away. "'I was down at the docks early this morning, sir,' he returned, "'to get information concerning of them ships. In about six weeks, or two months from now, there'll be one sailing. I see her this morning, went aboard, and we shall take our passage in her.' "'Quite alone?' I asked. "'Ay, Master Davy,' he returned. "'My sister, you see, she's that fond of you and yourn, and that accustomed to think only of her own country, that it wouldn't be hardly fair to let her go. Besides which, there's one she has in charge, Master Davy, as doin' ought to be forgot.' "'Poor Ham,' said I. "'My good sister takes care of his house, you see, ma'am, and he takes kindly to her,' Mr. Peggotty explained for my aunt's better information. He'll set and talk to her with a calm spirit when it's like he couldn't bring himself to open his lips to another. Poor fellow, said Mr. Peggotty, shaking his head. There's not so much left him that he could spare the little as he has. And Mrs. Gummidge, said I. Well, I've had a more to consideration, I do tell you, returned Mr. Peggotty, with a perplexed look which gradually cleared as he went on. Concerning of Mrs. Gummidge. You see, when Mrs. Gummidge falls at thinking of the old one, she ain't what you may call good company. Betwixt you and me, Master Davy, and you, ma'am, when Mrs. Gummidge takes to wimmickin, our old country word for crying, she's liable to be considered to be, by them as do it know the old one, peevish-like. Now I did know the old one, said Mr. Peggotty, and I know his merits, so I understand her. But tant entirely so, you see, with others, naturally can't be. My aunt and I both acquiesced. Whereby, said Mr. Peggotty, my sister might, I do not say she would, but might, find Mrs. Gummidge give her a little trouble now and again. Therefore, tant my intentions to more Mrs. Gummidge along o' them, but to find a being for where she can fisherate for herself. A being signifies in that dialect a home, and to fisherate is to provide. For which purpose, said Mr. Peggotty, I mean to make her allowance afore I go, as a leave her pretty comfortable. She's the faithfulest of creatures. Tant to be expected, of course, at her time of life, and being lone and lorn, as the good old Martha is to be knocked about aboard ship, and in the woods and wilds of a new faraway country. So that's what I were going to do with her. He forgot nobody. He thought of everybody's claims and strivings but his own. Emily, he continued, will keep along with me, poor child. She saw and need a peace and rest, until such time as we goes upon our voyage. She'll work at them clothes as must be made, and I hope her troubles will begin to seem longer ago than they was, when she finds herself once more by her rough but loving uncle. My aunt nodded confirmation of this hope, and imparted great satisfaction to Mr. Peggotty. "'There's one thing further, Master Davy,' he said, putting his hand in his breast-pocket, and gravely taking out the little paper bundle I had seen before, which he unrolled on the table. "'There's these here bank-notes, fifty pounds and ten. To them I wish to add the money as she came away with. I asked her about that, but not saying why, and I've added of it up. I ain't a scholar. Would you be so kind as to see how tis? He handed me, apologetically for his scholarship, a piece of paper, and observed me while I looked over it. It was quite right. "'Thank you, sir,' he said, taking it back. "'This money, if you do not see objections, Master Davy, I shall put up just afore I go in a cover directed to him, and put that up in another directed to his mother. I shall tell her, in no more words than I speak to you, what it's the price on, and that I'm gone and past receiving of it back.' I told him that I thought it would be right to do so, that I was thoroughly convinced it would be, since he felt it to be right. I said that there was only one thing further, he proceeded with a grave smile, when he had made up his little bundle again and put it in his pocket, but there was two. I weren't sure in my mind when I came out this morning as I could go and break to Ham, of my own self, what had so thankfully happened. So I writ a letter while I was out, and put it in the post-office, telling of him how all was as tis, and that I should come down to-morrow to unload my mind of what little needs a doin' of down there, and most like take my farewell leave of Yarmouth. "'And do you wish me to go with you?' said I, seeing that he left something unsaid. "'If you could do me that kind favour, Master Davy,' he replied, "'I know the sight of you would cheer him up a bit.'
My little Dora being in good spirits, and very desirous that I should go, as I found out on talking it over with her, I readily pledged myself to accompany him in accordance with his wish. Next morning, consequently, we were on the Yarmouth coach, and again travelling over the old ground. As we passed along the familiar street at night, Mr. Peggotty, in despite of all my remonstrances, carrying my bag, I glanced into Omer and Yoram's shop, and saw my old friend Mr. Omer there smoking his pipe. I felt reluctant to be present when Mr. Peggotty first met his sister and Ham, and made Mr. Omer my excuse for lingering behind. "'How is Mr. Omer after this long time?' said I, going in. He fanned away the smoke of his pipe that he might get a better view of me, and soon recognised me with great delight. "'I should get up, sir, to acknowledge such an honour as this visit,' said he. "'Only my limbs are rather out of sorts, and I'm wheeled about. With the exception of my limbs and my breath, howsoever, I am as hearty as a man can be, I'm thankful to say.' I congratulated him on his contented looks and his good spirits, and saw now that his easy chair went on wheels. "'It's an ingenious thing, ain't it?' he inquired, following the direction of my glance and polishing the elbow with his arm. "'It runs as light as a feather and tracks as true as a mail-coach. Bless you, my little Minnie, my granddaughter, you know, Minnie's child, puts her little strength against the back, gives it a shove, and away we go, as clever and merry as ever you see anything. And I'll tell you what, it's a most uncommon chair to smoke a pipe in.' I never saw such a good old fellow to make the best of a thing, and find out the enjoyment of it as Mr. Omer. He was as radiant as if his chair, his asthma, and the failure of his limbs were the various branches of a great invention for enhancing the luxury of a pipe. "'I see more of the world, I can assure you,' said Mr. Omer, "'in this chair than ever I see out of it. You'd be surprised at the number of people that looks in of a day to have a chat. You really would.' there's twice as much in the newspaper since i've taken to this chair as there used to be as to general reading dear me what a lot of it i do get through that's what i feel so strong you know if it had been my eyes what should i have done if it had been my ears what should i have done being my limbs what does it signify <laughs> my, my limbs only made my breath shorter when i use em and now if i want to go out into the street or up and down the sands i've only to call dick your youngest apprentice and away i go in my own carriage like the lord mayor of london he half suffocated himself with laughing here lord bless you said mr omer resuming his pipe a man must take the fat with the lean that's what he must make up his mind to do in this life yoram does a fine business excellent business i'm very glad to hear it said i i knew you would be said mr omer and yoram and minnie are like valentines what more can a man expect what's his limbs to that his supreme contempt for his own limbs, as he sat smoking, was one of the pleasantest oddities I have ever encountered. "'And since I've took to general reading, you've took to general writing, eh, sir?' said Mr. Omer, surveying me admiringly. "'What a lovely work that was of yours! What expressions in it! I read it every word, every word, and as to feeling sleepy, not at all!' I laughingly expressed my satisfaction, but I must confess that I thought this association of ideas significant. "'I give you my word and honour, sir,' said Mr. Omer, "'that when I lay that book upon the table, and look at it outside, compact in three separate and individual volumes, one, two, three, I am as proud as punch to think that I once had the honour of being connected with your family. But, dear me, it's a long time ago now, ain't it?' over a blunderstone, with a pretty little party laid along with the other party, and you quite a small party then yourself. Dear, dear. I changed the subject by referring to Emily, after assuring him that I did not forget how interested he had always been in her, and how kindly he had always treated her, I gave him a general account of her restoration to her uncle by the aid of Martha, which I knew would please the old man. He listened with the utmost attention, and said, feelingly, when I had done, I am rejoiced to hear it, sir. It's the best news I have had for many a day. Dear, dear, dear. And what's going to be undertook with that unfortunate young woman, Martha, now? You touch a point that my thoughts had been dwelling on since yesterday, said I, but on which I can give you no information yet, Mr. Omer. 
Mr. Peggotty has not alluded to it, and I have a delicacy in doing so. I am sure he has not forgotten it. He forgets nothing that is disinterested and good. "'Because, you know,' said Mr. Omer, taking himself up where he had left off, "'whatever is done, I should wish to be a member of. Put me down for anything you may consider right, and let me know. I could never think the girl all bad, and I'm glad to find she's not. So will my daughter Minnie be. Young women are contradictory creatures in some things. Her mother was just the same as her, but their hearts are soft and kind. It's all show with Minnie about Martha.' Why she should consider it necessary to make a show, I don't undertake to tell you. But it's all show, bless you. She'd do her any kindness and private. So put me down for whatever you may consider right, will you be so good? And drop me a line where to forward it. Dear me, said Mr. Omer, when a man is drawn on to a time of life where the two ends of life meet, when he finds himself, however hearty he is, being wheeled about for the second time, in a species of go-cart, he should be over-rejoiced to do a kindness if he can. He wants plenty, and I don't speak of myself particular, said Mr. Omer, because, sir, the way I look at it is that we are all drawn on to the bottom of the hill, whatever age we are, on account of time never standing still for a single moment. So let us always do a kindness and be over-rejoiced, <laughs> to be sure. He knocked the ashes out of his pipe and put it on a ledge in the back of his chair, expressly made for its reception. "'There's Emily's cousin, him that she was to be married to,' said Mr. Omer, rubbing his hands feebly. "'As fine a fellow as there is in Yarmouth. He'll come and talk or read to me in the evening, for an hour together sometimes. That's a kindness, I should call it. All his life's a kindness.' "'I'm going to see him now,' said I. "'Are you?' said Mr. Omer. Tell him I was hearty, and send my respects. Minnie and Yoram's at a ball. They would be as proud to see you as I am, if they was at home. Minnie won't hardly go out at all now, you see, on account of father, as she says, so I swore to-night that if she didn't go, I'd go to bed at six. In consequence of which, Mr. Omer shook himself in his chair with laughter at the success of his device. She <laughs> and Yoram's at the ball. I shook hands with him and wished him good night. Half a minute, sir, said Mr. Omer. If you was to go without seeing my little elephant, you'd lose the best of sights. You never see such a sight. Minnie, a musical little voice answered from somewhere upstairs. I'm coming, grandfather. And a pretty little girl with long flaxen curling hair soon came running into the shop. This is my little elephant, sir, said Mr. Omer, fondling the child. Siamese breed, sir. Now, little elephant. The little elephant set the door of the parlour open, enabling me to see that, in these latter days, it was converted into a bedroom for Mr. Omer, who could not be easily conveyed upstairs, and then hid her pretty forehead and tumbled her long hair against the back of Mr. Omer's chair. The elephant butts, you know, sir, said Mr. Omer, winking, when he goes at an object. Once elephant, twice, three times. At this signal, the little elephant, with a dexterity that was next to marvellous in so small an animal, whisked the chair round with Mr. Omer in it, and rattled it off pell-mell into the parlour, without touching the door-post. Mr. Omer, indescribably enjoying the performance, and looking back at me on the road, as if it were the triumphant issue of his life's exertions. After a stroll about the town, I went to Ham's house. Peggotty had now removed here for good, and had let her own house to the successor of Mr. Barkis in the carrying business, who had paid her very well for the good will, cart, and horse. I believe the very same slow horse that Mr. Barkis drove was still at work. I found him in a neat kitchen, accompanied by Mrs. Gummidge, who had been fetched from the old boat by Mr. Peggotty himself. I doubt if she could have been induced to desert her post by anyone else. He had evidently told them all. Both Peggotty and Mrs. Gummidge had their aprons to their eyes, and Ham had just stepped out to take a turn on the beach. He presently came home very glad to see me, and I hope they were all the better for my being there. We spoke with some approach to cheerfulness of Mr. Peggotty's growing rich in a new country, and of the wonders he would describe in his letters. We said nothing of Emily by name, but distantly referred to her more than once. Ham was the serenest of the party. But, Peggotty told me, when she lighted me to a little chamber where the crocodile book was lying ready for me on the table, that he always was the same. She believed, she told me, crying, that he was broken-hearted. 
though he was still as full of courage as of sweetness and worked harder and better than any boat builder in any yard in all that part there were times she said of an evening when he talked of their old life in the boat-house and then he mentioned emily as a child but he never mentioned her as a woman i thought i had read in his face that he would like to speak to me alone i therefore resolved to put myself in his way next evening as he came home from his work having settled this with myself i fell asleep that night for the first time in all those many nights the candle was taken out of the window mr peggotty swung in his old hammock in the old boat and the wind murmured with the old sound round his head all next day he was occupied in disposing of his fishing-boat and tackle in packing up and sending to london by wagon such of his little domestic possessions as he thought would be useful to him and in parting with the rest or bestowing them on mrs gummidge she was with him all day as I had a sorrowful wish to see the old place once more before it was locked up, I engaged to meet them there in the evening. But I so arranged it that I should meet Ham first. It was easy to come in his way, as I knew where he worked. I met him at a retired part of the sands, which I knew he would cross, and turned back with him that he might have leisure to speak to me if he really wished. I had not mistaken the expression of his face, and we walked but a little way together when he said, without looking at me, "'Master Davy, have you seen her?' "'Only for a moment, when she was in a swoon,' I softly answered. We walked a little farther, and he said, "'Master Davy, shall you see her, do you think?' "'It would be too painful to her, perhaps,' said I. "'I have thought of that,' he replied. "'So twould, sir, so twould.' "'But, Ham, said I gently, if there is anything I could write to her for you, in case I could not tell it, if there is anything you would wish to make known to her through me, I should consider it a sacred trust. I am sure on it, I thank you, sir, most kind. I think there is something I could wish said or wrote. What is it? We walked a little farther in silence, and then he spoke. Tan't that I forgive her, tan't that so much. Tis more as I beg of her to forgive me, for having pressed my affections upon her. Odd times I think that if I hadn't had her promise for to marry me, sir, she was that trustful of me, in a friendly way, that she'd have told me what was struggling her mind, and would have counselled with me, and I might have saved her. I pressed his hand. Is that all? There's yet something else, he returned. If I can say it, Master Davy. We walked on, farther than we had walked yet, before he spoke again. He was not crying when he made the pauses I shall express by lines. He was merely collecting himself to speak very plainly. I loved her, and I loved the memory of her, too deep to be able to lead her to believe of my own self as I'm a happy man. I only could be happy by forgetting of her, and I'm afeard as I couldn't hardly bear as she should be told I'd done that. But if you, being so full of learning, Master Davy, could think of anything to say as might bring her to believe I wasn't greatly hurt, still loving of her and mourning for her, anything as might bring her to believe, as I was not tired of my life, and yet was hoping for to see her without blame, where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest, anything as would ease her sorrowful mind, and yet not make her think as I could ever marry or as t'was possible that any one could ever be to me what she was, I should ask of you to say that, with my prayers for her that was so dear. I pressed his manly hand again, and told him I would charge myself to do that as well as I could. I thank you, sir, he answered. T'was kind of you to meet me. T'was kind of you to bear him company down. Master Davy, I understand very well, though my aunt will come to London afore they sail, and they'll unite once more, that I'm not like to see him again. I fare to feel sure on t we don't say so, but so twill be, and better so. The last you see on him, the very last, will you give him the lovingest duty and thanks of the orphan, as he was ever more than a father to? This I also promised faithfully. I thank ye again, sir, he said, heartily shaking hands. I know where you're a-going. Good-bye. With a slight wave of his hand, as though to explain to me that he could not enter the old place, he turned away. As I looked after his figure, crossing the waste in the moonlight, I saw him turn his face towards a strip of silvery light upon the sea, and pass on, looking at it, until he was a shadow in the distance. 
The door of the boathouse stood open when I approached, and on entering I found it emptied of all its furniture, saving one of the old lockers on which Mrs. Gummidge, with a basket on her knee, was seated, looking at Mr. Peggotty. He leaned his elbow upon the rough chimney-piece, and gazed upon a few expiring embers in the grate, but he raised his head hopefully on my coming in, and spoke in a cheery manner. "'Come according to promise to bid farewell to it, eh, Master Davy?' he said, taking up the candle. "'Bare enough now, ain't it?' "'Indeed, you made good use of the time,' said I. "'Why, we have not been idle, sir. Mrs. Gummidge has worked like a—' "'I do not know what Mrs. Gummidge ain't worked like,' said Mr. Peggotty, looking at her, at a loss for a sufficiently approving simile. Mrs. Gummidge, leaning on her basket, made no observation. "'There's the very locker that you used to sit on along with Emily,' said Mr. Peggotty in a whisper. "'I'm a-going to carry it away with me last of all. "'And here's your old little bedroom, see, Master Davy, "'almost as bleak to-night as art could wish.' In truth, the wind, though it was low, had a solemn sound, and crept round the deserted house with a whispered wailing that was very mournful. Everything was gone, down to the little mirror with the oyster-shell frame. I thought of myself lying here when that first great change was being wrought at home. I thought of the blue-eyed child who had enchanted me. I thought of Steerforth, and a foolish, fearful fancy came upon me of his being near at hand, and liable to be met at any turn. "'Tis like to be long,' said Mr. Peggotty, in a low voice, "'afore the boat finds new tenants. They look upon down here as being unfortunate now.' "'Does it belong to anybody in the neighbourhood? I asked. "'To a mass-maker up-town,' said Mr. Peggotty. "'I'm a-going to give the key to him to-night.' We looked into the other little room, and came back to Mrs. Gummidge, sitting on the locker, whom Mr. Peggotty, putting the light on the chimney-piece, requested to rise, that he might carry it outside the door before extinguishing the candle. "'Dan'l,' said Mrs. Gummidge, suddenly deserting her basket and clinging to his arm, "'my dear Dan'l, the parting words I speak in this house is, I mustn't be left behind. Don't you think of leaving me behind, Dan'l? Oh, don't ye ever do it?' Mr. Peggotty, taken aback, looked from Mrs. Gummidge to me, and from me to Mrs. Gummidge, as if he'd been awakened from a sleep. "'Doin' ye, dearest Dan'l, doin' ye,' cried Mrs. Gummidge fervently. "'Take me along with you, Dan'l, take me along with you and Emily. I'll be your servant, constant and true. If there's slaves in them there parts where you're a-goin', I'll be bound to you for one and happy. But doin' ye leave me behind, Dan'l, that's a dearie dear.' "'A good soul,' said Mr. Peggotty, shaking his head. "'You do not know what a long voyage and what a hard life tis.' "'Yes, I do, Dan'l, I can guess,' cried Mrs. Gummidge. "'But my parting words under this roof is, "'I shall go into the house and die if I'm not took. "'I can dig, Dan'l, I can work, I can live hard. "'I can be loving and patient now more than you think, Dan'l, "'if you'll only try me.' "'I wouldn't touch the allowance not if I was dying of want, Dan'l Peggotty. "'But I'll go with you and Emily, if you'll only let me to the world's end. "'I know how tis. I know you think that I'm lone and lorn, "'but, dearie love, tan so no more. "'I ain't sat here so long a-watching and a-thinking of your trials "'without some good being done. "'Master Davy, speak to him for me. "'I knows his ways and Emily's. "'I knows their sorrows and can be a comfort to him some odd times "'and labour for him all his. "'Dan'l, dearie Dan'l, let me go along with you.' "'And Mrs. Gummidge took his hand and kissed it with a homely pathos and affection, "'in a homely rapture of devotion and gratitude that he well deserved. "'We brought the locker out, extinguished the candle, "'fastened the door on the outside, and left the old boat close shut up, a dark speck in the cloudy night. Next day, when we were returning to London outside the coach, Mrs. Gummidge and her basket were on the seat behind, and Mrs. Gummidge was happy. End of chapter 51